Hi everyone, in this video we're going to look at seven ways to improve your soloing. So you can take it from something like this. To something a little more like this. Let's dive straight in. The first tip I'm going to give you is to think about your phrasing. So by phrasing, I mean how many notes are in each one of our phrases, so how short or long they are, as well as where in the bar the phrases are starting and ending. Now, if we're always having the same length phrases and they're always starting either at the beginning of the bar on beat one or just always staying on beat, it's not gonna sound very inspired. Something like this. Now there's nothing wrong with doing that every now and then, but if it's all we've got in our locker, it's going to get boring to listen to pretty quickly. So I'm going to give you an example now where I'm going to specifically try to avoid starting and ending phrases both on the beat or at the beginning of the bar on beat one. And I'm also going to vary the length of the phrases much more than I did just now. So I'm gonna put this example in the really guitar-y key of E. So our E pentatonic scale will be this one here. <laughs> which I'm hoping is really familiar territory for you. And I'm probably gonna keep most of our examples in this key as well throughout the video. Okay, let's check out the first example where we're gonna think about our phrasing. The second tip is to think about articulations. Now, articulations is just an umbrella term for bends, hammer-ons, pull-offs, slides, things I'm sure you're familiar with, but I just wanna highlight the extent to which there's such a variety of ways we can implement these techniques and you might not be using them to their full capabilities. Okay, so let's start with bends. We can, of course, vary how much we're bending the string. So we can do a full tone bend, a little bit more for a tone and a half bend, a little bit less for a half tone bend. And my personal favorite quarter tone bends where we're just hinting at a different pitch. So let's now think about the different ways in which we can use these bends. So we can have our super conventional bend, which we're just pushing the string up. We can have a bend release. We can have a bend release and rebend. We can have a pre-bend release. We can have a pre-bend release and re-bend. We can have unison bends. We can have bends on two adjacent strings. And a little bit of a wild one, we can have a bend, release, slide up two frets and re-bend all in one kind of smooth motion. And that's a good hack for getting out of two tone bends if like me, you're afraid of snapping a string. So I'm also gonna just incorporate at this point the use of staccato notes either side of some of these bends. So our staccato notes are of course when we're just playing very short, sharp notes like this. So making sure we're not letting them ring, we're just killing them dead as soon as we pick the string. In terms of the music, you're going to have to keep an eye on the notation part rather than the tab to see which notes are staccato. This will be indicated by a very small dot directly above the staccato notes. Unfortunately, the tab doesn't really give us any indication of which notes are staccato. Okay, let's have a little listen to an example where I'm gonna try and shoehorn in as many different types of these bends in as short a time as possible. Staying with articulations, let's now look at our hammer-ons and pull-offs. These are great to use if you want to build longer phrases with a little bit more speed, particularly if, like me, you kind of suck at alternate picking. Slides you can use in a really practical way to help get you either backwards or forwards in between different scale positions. We can also introduce grace notes to help vary how these hammer-ons, pull-offs, and slides sound. Now, grace notes are two notes which are played as close together as possible so that they almost sound as one. An example here using hammer-ons sounds like this. 
You can also do it with a slide, either forwards or backwards. I'm sure you agree the uh, backwards slide grace note sounds particularly gnarly. We can also use a combination of our hammer-ons, pull-offs and slides. For example, a hammer-on slide forward and back and then pull-off. Or a personal favourite is where we do a very quick slide forwards and back followed by a pull-off like this. But just in a very particular speed. Okay, uh, let's have a little look at an example now where we're going to see a lot of these types of hammer-ons, pull-offs and slides, both as they are and also as grace notes. Let's check it out. If you're still watching and you're enjoying these tips, please give the video a thumbs up, leave a comment if you've got any questions and hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel and I'd be super grateful. Stick around to the end of the video where I'm gonna give you a bonus tip which ties all of the other seven tips together. The third tip is to think about rhythm and specifically the different types of rhythm we're incorporating into our soloing. Now, there's a whole world of different rhythms out there and we don't have to know them all or be able to use them all. We just need enough in our arsenal that our lead playing has a good amount of rhythmic variety. So the most basic rhythm we're gonna have is just quarter notes, which are literally in time with the beat. One, two, three, four. We can have our eighth notes, which are twice as fast. One and two and three and four and. We can have our 16th notes, which are twice as fast again. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. We can then start seeing rhythms which are a little bit more across the beat. For example, triplets. So triplet quarter notes sound like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. We can have our triplet eighth notes, which are just three in the space of each beat. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And I'm also going to introduce a slightly more complex rhythm in the following example, which is quintuplets. Now this is where we're fitting five notes in the space of one beat. To help conceptualize this, it's useful to think of words which have five syllables. So for example, university. So quintuplet sounds like this. University, 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 university. So it's a little bit faster than our 16th notes, but a little bit slower than what would be sextuplets fitting six notes in the space of one beat. Okay, let's check out this next example, which is gonna use a greater rhythmic variety in the phrases. The fourth tip is to think about groove. Now, whilst this relates to rhythm, we're gonna be more concerned about the placement of our notes and how this ends up creating a particular rhythmic feel. Now, the best example I can give of this is if you think about a full bar of 16th notes, and we're gonna try and target the notes which fall in between the beat and the offbeat, so the E's and A's. What this is gonna do is it's gonna create a very funky sounding groove and one which is quite syncopated, meaning that there's rhythmic emphasis in places where you wouldn't usually expect to find them. Something else we can do thinking about groove, which is also really cool, is if we take this 16th note rhythm, which is one very much uh, divided into fours, because we've got four notes to each beat, and we end up playing in that rhythm, but doing a sequence of notes, which is not four notes. So for example, doing a three note pattern in this 16th note rhythm, you have something which ends up going kind of across the beat in a pretty cool way. Uh, something like this, one, two, three, four. And that's a really cool cross rhythm sounding phrase. Okay, let's check out this example where we're gonna see these groove principles in practice. Just another quick tip for groove, because I find myself doing this quite often, particularly if you're playing along to a song at a slower tempo, around about here. Rather than playing straight 16th notes like this,
You can choose to swing your 16th notes, which gives it a much more groovy feel like this. The fifth tip is to think about our dynamics, which means how loud or soft we're playing. And we can use this way of thinking to also vary the way in which we're playing notes. For example, if we're looking for a loud dynamic, we can of course just dig in really hard with the pick like this. And give a good little bit of vibrato to help emphasize notes. But another technique we can introduce is the idea of a little bit of hybrid picking. So I'm going to use my middle finger to actually get underneath the string and kind of pop it outwards, which gives us a really percussive and loud sound like this. Which is a really nice dynamic contrast, especially in context of a longer line of predominantly pick notes. Something else we can do in terms of quieter dynamics is, even though we're soloing, introducing a little bit of palm mutant notes, particularly on the lower strings like this. You know, just because we're soloing doesn't mean we can't palm mute, which gives us, again, a nice dynamic and tonal variety in the playing. Finally, something which I'm quite a fan of doing is doing a crescendo. So starting quiet and getting louder. This works well on one single note. But sounds particularly cool if you start a bend really slowly and get louder as the bend comes up like this. Really, really nice accent to that as well. Okay, let's have a look at this example now, which is going to use a greater dynamic variety. The sixth tip is to think about our tone, and I'm not just talking about what amp or pedals we're going through, I'm talking about on the guitar itself, where we've got volume and tone pots, as well as our pickup selector. Now, for all of the previous examples, I've just been sticking on my bridge pickup with the volume and tone pots turned up all the way, as I've been looking for that fairly standard high gain lead sound like this. But if I stay on the same sound and change to my neck pickup and just play with a little bit of a softer dynamic, you can already see how much of a different tone that creates, like this. If you've got a Strat type guitar like this, don't overlook the pickup positions where you've got either your neck and middle pickup together, or as I'm about to demonstrate, your middle and bridge pickup together, which has almost a little bit of a cool twangy quality to it. Another way to really change the tone is, especially if we've got quite a high gain setting on our amp or through the pedals, is to roll off your volume quite a bit, which is going to give us a more subtle and kind of more soulful bluesy guitar tone. And this also works really well if you're on your neck pickup and something like this. The next example is going to be the only time we're going to take a departure from the key of E as I'm throwing in a little bit of shameless self-promotion and using a snippet from the solo to the second song in my EP. This is going to be in the key of G, so our pentatonic scale is going to be found here. <laughs> And also I'm practicing what I preach in the sense of in this part of the solo, it's a little bit more stripped back and I'm playing with a little bit of a quieter dynamic and I've still got a high gain amp setting, but I was on the neck pickup of my Telecaster and both the volume and tone pot were rolled to about halfway, which really gave it that more soulful kind of cool sound. I'll put a link in the description below just in case you want to check out the other songs in my EP. Please do. Let's have a listen to this example.
The seventh tip is to think about our note selection. Now, most of the examples so far have been predominantly using the pentatonic scale, which is absolutely fine, particularly if we've been using all of these techniques to really vary our playing. However, if you want to introduce a little bit more harmonic variety to our solos, then we can start to think about borrowing notes from other scales. So first of all, we can actually just make the pentatonic scale a little bit fuller by introducing the additional notes which are found in the natural minor scale. In the case of us being in E, this would look like this. So it still keeps all the same notes of the pentatonic scale, but we've just got another two notes in each octave. Another scale which we can borrow a note from is the Dorian mode. Now this is almost the exact same as the natural minor that we just looked at, but it's got one note different, particularly it's going to be the C is going to become a C sharp. So the scale shape is now going to look like this. <laughs> And this works particularly well given the kind of two chord vamp we've got in the background of these examples I've been showing you where we basically got an E7 chord followed by an A7 chord. So particularly over that A chord, that characteristic note, C sharp, which we find here and here, is going to work really well over that A chord. But you can also use it over the E chord and it sounds cool. Another scale we can borrow a note from is the harmonic minor scale. Now this is going to be a little bit more out there in terms of applying it particularly over the backing track that I'm using at the moment, but we still can. So the harmonic minor is where we've got our full natural minor scale again, but you're raising the seventh note by a semitone, so it ends up looking like this. <laughs> And on its own, that probably sounds nothing like something appropriate to use over the chords we've got in these examples. But if we use it very, very sparingly or just kind of target that characteristic harmonic minor note over the E chord in very, very kind of precise moments, it can still work and sound really cool. The key thing just to remember overall is you don't have to feel like you need to use these additional notes all the time. They're just there to give us a little bit of extra harmonic flavor when we use it sparingly and just in very choice moments in our soloing. Let's check out our final example where we're now going to see some of these notes from our natural minor, Dorian and harmonic minor mode incorporated into a example solo. And obviously I've kept the hardest one to last, so good luck. Now for the important bonus tip, which is going to tie everything else we've learned in this video together. Really, it's the overall perspective that everything we have learned is just to give you a bigger set of tools to use when you're soloing. And it doesn't mean that we have to use them all, all of the time. In fact, that would be overkill and we'd probably end up overplaying. Sometimes it's okay to actually do the more simple and predictable stuff as long as we're interspersing it with any one of the techniques we've looked at in this video to make our playing a lot more varied and interesting and less predictable. It's now going to be down to you to discern at what point we're going to want to lean more on our phrasing, our articulations, our rhythm, our groove, our use of dynamics, our use of tone and our note selection depending on what musical context we're finding ourselves in or what musical style we're playing in. To an extent that's subjective but really trust your ears and if it sounds good then run with it. If it doesn't try to mix it up a little bit and use another one of our techniques and see if that fits better. A final thought when it comes to developing our soloing, really try to listen to as wide a variety of music as possible. So I'm not just talking about listening to a lot of different guitarists, that's obviously very necessary, but really listen to a lot of different instrumentalists as well and think about how is a saxophone player soloing or how is a keys player soloing and try to see if you can kind of incorporate some of their ideas in terms of their phrasing, etc, etc, and incorporate into your own playing as well. Most importantly, we're just trying to find as wide a range as possible of different sources to inspire our own playing so that we end up having our own voice. Thank you so much for watching and sticking around to the end. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to help out the channel. If you have any questions at all, just leave a comment and I'll be more than happy to help. See you all next time.